Welcome to The Contentious Life. My name's Sam, and you're joined by my co-host, Sam. Hello. Well, we had a fabulous first two shows, and congratulations and thank you for getting to the third episode and listening. Um, I know. It will get better, honest, and uh, you know we won't cut each other off like I just did there. Yeah. I do apologise, but yeah, the chemistry is still brewing. It is brewing, it is brewing. Busy and, from the get-go. And I think the format is also becoming more honed and more sharp, and I think it's going to become something we really need to listen to week after week. Um, just a quick apology. Last week we said we were going to talk about TLAs, three-letter acronyms, and some other various things, and we've actually decided to change because we've thought of even better ones and more interesting ones. Mm, more contentious, definitely. Definitely more contentious. Um, I think my, uh, in episode four, I think my overrated choice, which I'm going to keep you in the dark about, is going to make me even more of a homophobe than when I last talked about campness. <laughs> but still, uh, <laughs> I look forward to the hate mail. He's the most homophobic gay I know. Yeah. And just a quick one. Uh, if you would like to contact us to send us hate mail, praise mail, anything, suggest topics, then you can do at contact at thecontentiouslife.co.uk. We look forward to hearing from you. I think Sam should be the one to kick us off yeah. on this uh, third episode. Episode? Uh, I think... Uh, Sam should introduce it and uh, just go straight into why he thinks it's uh, an overrated topic. That's right. My overrated for this week is the Great Apple Corporation. Oh, okay. I think you've got a fan of this one already. Yeah. Well, there's lots of Apple fans out there who are going to find this most contentious and most obnoxious. But hey. I'm an Android user and believe in Android, so I'm automatically against iOS. Well, what I'd like to say is it's it's good Hardware, you know, the Apple make good quality stuff, and you can't mm. deny that, but it's just also restricted, isn't it? And, you know, everything's got to be kept within Apple's framework, and, you know, they call it the walled garden. Yeah, I remember when I first, I fell in love, well, no, I didn't fall in love, I fell for the gimmicks Apple put out on one of their first iPhones, and yeah. I bought an iPhone, and one of the first things I realised I had to do, which I really didn't want to do, was convert my whole music media library into the protected format just uh, to get it onto my iPhone. Is that uh, AAC or something? Yes, yes. And I was, I was just in pieces. I was like, I can't deal with this. I was. So, um, is that uh, what Apple uses for everything then? I mean, on the iPod and everything, because um, doesn't it uh, yeah. convert it automatically now? Yeah, was there does. a point when it didn't used to? No, it always it converted itself. automatically. Sometimes it started without even asking you, so you were just like, oh, my media is being converted. <laughs> so um, it not only it, it converts it for well, for your iPod, but it also it, uh, it also does the ones on your computer as well, does it? Yeah, it'll search for them. if you Well, if you tell it to be able to search for them, yeah, it'll search for them and add them. And I, th- I well, and talking about that, I find that quite restrictive. I also found with the uh, iPhone that there's a lot of restrictions when you plug your phone in to the computer. You can't use it as mass storage. I know that really annoys me. You yeah. can't just look at the. Uh, well, I was going to say MP3s then, but uh, AACs as a as a hard disk partition. You can't look at them. You can't jiggle them around. You can't just easily open up as a mass storage and take all your photos off. You've got to use iTunes or yeah. Windows Importer. I think can do it now. Windows Photo and Video Importer. But um, it was a long time. It was really restrictive. Um, mm. Obviously, this is to do with why Apple are so popular is they, they're really brand strong. They, it's part of keeping everything part of the Apple product and the wow. Apple experience. Yeah, well, you could, you could go a step further than saying brand strong. You know, it's about the cult of personality of the late Mr. Jobs, isn't it? Really? Yeah, well, you, know? you could go that far, actually. Judging from, I saw tributes and memorials after his death, people... Was setting up original um, iMacs from back in the you know eighties. They were setting them up in shop door, uh, doorways of shops with an mm. apple on top and a, and a picture of him and candles like a, oh, a, shrine. Like a shrine. Yeah, I saw quite a lot of that, and oh, God. It, it, there is a cult. Yeah, it sounds like something you'd see in North Korea. You know, the Kims. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. when one of them passes on, I bet you know there's a whole official state of mourning for about six months, and yeah. anybody caught laughing gets shot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Or anyone caught, you know, not crying as well. Because yeah. I think you've got to force tears of happiness uh, as well yeah. as tears of... Uh, are we still talking about uh, the Kims now? Are we talking about Steve Jobs? I was talking about both, actually. <laughs> but, yeah. but yeah, I imagine, uh, you know, go past the Apple shop and if you don't uh, look visibly upset, then some Apple fans might, you know, sort of form an angry pitchfork waving mob. Yeah. Are they that bad? Yeah. I Could be. I think uh, I've got quite a few family and friends who are 
Apple freaks, you know, as soon as they got their iPhone, they went and bought a MacBook Pro, mm. then they bought um, an iPad, and then they bought the newest iPad, or the next newest iPad. And the watch. And the, Well, the watch is the next one, which I haven't seen anyone buy. I'd like to see if anyone is going to buy it out of my friends, because I really see it as a, an ultimate luxury item, which has mm. no real purpose. I've, I've seen an advert for it, and it looks good, and as with all this stuff, it looks good, you know, but mm. I just, I don't fancy getting tied up into Apple's bullshit, you know? Yeah. Having to go through them for everything, and getting stuff only on their app store, and not being able to just use it as I want. And yeah. Of course, with most Apple things, the the cases are sealed as well, so you can't even upgrade the memory, or carry around a spare battery. You know, I used to love carrying around a spare battery for my Android phone, and my wallet, you know, it was a slim battery. Slipped in my wallet. If, if I was mm. caught in a bind, I could just like whack out the dead battery and put in a new one. Yeah. And of course, the SD card, I can upgrade that whenever I like. Well, I don't own an Android now, but when I did. But you know what I mean? You can't do yeah. any of that on an Apple. And I, got, I got into an argument with somebody in a pub beer garden in Pont de Breed because uh, he was saying he was just like miserable to, about Android, you know, because Android was just getting popular. He was like, oh, Android's a piece of shit. And I said, well, at least I can open the back of mine and change a battery when I need to. And he went, oh, well, I can open my iPhone. I'm a technician. <laughs> That's amazing. Ooh, he's a technician everybody he can open the back with this magic screwdriver well great but you shouldn't have to yeah i think that's a, a good point actually um but i have to say that a lot of the android phones these days are going the way of a sealed unit my htc1 which was the m6 or 7 it was one of the older ones anyway um that was sealed it was a sealed piece of metal right um, so how did they get the stuff in warning Tangent. Warning. Tangent. Warning. I don't know. They must... I think sort of grow it in biologically or something. Yeah, I think like so. Like some sort of David Cronenberg. Yeah, thing. they've got like loads of petri dishes set up with just like, you know, animals with like um, uh, circuit boards attached to their backs and then they extract mm. it and kind of, I don't know, it makes you wonder actually. It does make you wonder. Yeah, like that. Well, like that. Uh, have you seen Exist Ends by David Cronenberg? Yeah, I have, yeah. And it's like using DNA to build machines rather than like building them, just find out the DNA that matches that specification and let them grow, I think, yeah. and it? Let the machines just grow like they were an animal. And that's the great thing about science fiction and about speculative fiction, they call it, is that they take what could happen and what is happening a lot of the times, you know, in scientific research, and they actually extrapolate and then show you what could be a reality quite soon. Yeah, like, well, one of the most famous proponents of that sort of idea is, well, Arthur C. Clarke, isn't it, mm -hmm. 2001? And didn't he also theorise the satellite as well yeah. before, before it was uh, actually proposed properly yes there was uh, quite a lot of um ideas within science fiction arguably a lot in star trek which has come to pass more recently um, yeah you think because i always thought of star trek as more signed more sort of like junk food sci-fi you know not like a serious sci-fi if you can get such uh, a thing i think some of the technical stuff was based in ideas which were floating around when scientists were testing you know to do with yeah th theories around quantum physics and they um did correctly predict certain things they now know are true and that's yeah, well, purely through extrapolation of what was going on at the time and research in the 90s early 2000s but um i know like a lot of trekkies have been going on about the tricorder and one day they'll exist you yeah. know but are these are these the same kind of people who uh they go on about one day they'll be able to wield a real life lightsaber i think <laughs> i think that, i think they are the same people actually um i'd like to see the in america obviously you, you've got in some places laws where you can openly carry guns in pure sight that's fine and i just wonder is that going to be a load of, a load of um star wars fans parading around wielding lightsabers is that going to be okay to do <laughs> well i suppose they would have to be classed as a weapon wouldn't they you know yeah. if they did exist and like really it's going to be a majorly destructive weapon as well so is there going to be sort of like laws where you can have a lightsaber over a certain length is illegal if it's six inches, it's fine. If it's over six inches, then it's classed as illegal. You can't yeah. have it. And then there's a wattage as well. Don't forget that. You know, you've yeah. got an eight watt lightsaber versus a twenty four watt <laughs> lightsaber. You know, there's <laughs> got to be regulations on that. Yeah. But uh, anyway, I think you know, going from a uh, mad rampant Star Trek and Star Wars fans back to mad rampant Steve Jobs fans. Yeah. Uh, where are we at on there then? What are we talking about? I think I agree with you. It's overrated. I what I find most, I think it is sinister rather than the products themselves being totally overhyped, and they're not really as amazing as people think they are. They just go, oh, look what I can do with this, this is amazing. That's I think true. more than that is the, the market in itself, how it, it always is a rev, they always market it as a revolutionary, will change your life type of thing. Yeah, and yeah, like realize, this changes everything. Yeah, again. Again, and they actually say that like in every keynote lecture they ever do, is you'll never guess what we've done. We've made it lighter, thinner, faster, 
harder, more better, expensive. stronger. Yeah, <laughs> and it's just it's the same stuff every time, and um, I find that quite annoying. Yeah, it's a bit culty, isn't it? And uh, which also reminds me of uh, in the eighties, there was an Apple advert for I think it was for the Apple II computer, or was it for the first Apple Macintosh, the proper first Macintosh? And the, the slogan was insanely great. And Ridley Scott directed the advert, and it was like a. Uh, it was like some sort of cult initiation meeting, you know, the big guy head honcho at the front and all the uh, admiring onlookers look like something out of, I don't know, Nazi Germany or North Korea. And, you know, it, it yeah. had that sort of vibe and they picked Ridley Scott to direct it. So it had that kind of dark Blade Runner vibe to it, like dystopian future where Steve Jobs is, you know, the king of everything and everything is owned by Muck Apple or something. <laughs> That is so prophetic. Wasn't that prophetic? It really did yeah. predict what happened. And pathetic, but yeah, it's both, <laughs> both <laughs> yeah. pathetics. Yeah, it was. Um, one bugbear I have about Apple, I almost forgot about this one, is uh, this idea among sort of creative types that you need an Apple device to do your, to ply your trade, you know, music or graphic design. Got to have an Apple, you know, go into any Absolutely. music studio. This is one of my biggest annoyances, and I didn't think about this until you just mentioned it. People use the argument, Mum, Dad, I'm going to university, I'm studying music technology or whatever. I need a MacBook. And it's I need an iMac. Otherwise I literally there's you know, Windows Windows cannot record audio. We've known this for so long now. (laughs) Oh apparently not. No, I mean we're not we're not using a Windows system to record this, are we? No, we're not, not at all. We've got like three iMacs set up, two iPads, and you know, we've got a watch on which is uh Oh yeah. And special Apple cables for everything, you know, with double sheathed and shielded and (laughs) <laughs> they are double sheathed of gold and cobwebs and oh, all and sorts of palladium. Silk, palladium, yeah. All those other rare metals that you need. We've to actually make bought a cable. A, we've bought a mini reactor to get it all going. So, uh, what an eye reactor! Yeah. You bought one, did you? Oh, yeah. Is that what that is? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> That's what's churning out that heat in the corner. Oh, what you mean, eye heat? I- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, I, this reminds me of uh, a bit of McDonald's, um, where they brand everything Mac something, hmm. and they brand everything I something. I just wonder, you know, it becomes a joke in the end. It's like, you know, what are they going to create next? They've just got eye in front of it. Yeah, well, like, there's a South Park episode, The Human Scent iPad. You know, have you seen that? <laughs> no, I haven't, actually. Oh, uh, well, I'm not going to give too much away. It's quite a funny South Park episode that parodies yeah. the whole Apple thing and the cult of Steve Jobs. And it does a whole thing about, like, you know, when people sign, well, click the I agree with the end user license agreement and... <laughs> In this, there's loads of really draconian clauses in the in the contract that they've unwittingly, you know, said yes to. Yeah. Which ends up getting them turned into human centipedes. So, um, yeah, anything more on Apple then? I've got one or two things to say. Um, I just think that the next most annoying thing after the products themselves being not as amazing as, as people say they are, the most annoying thing is that people actually use them and the attitude of Apple users. Yeah. I think that's one of the most frustrating things yeah i know someone who was a well he still is like a music producer and he used to just like slag off cubase and stuff just in front of me just to like get under my skin and you know he used yeah. to love his mac and all that stuff but uh, going back to what you said though about um like the watch and how it's all like razzmatazzy and nice um i was gonna say that i think sooner or later just like they have done with the phones and the the uh tablets android and to an extent i suppose windows phone as well will catch up you know the Galaxy, I think, is better than the iPhone now, and the you know Galaxy tablet's better than the iPad, and I think sooner or later there's going to be an Android watch that's going to eclipse the iWatch. Yeah. And Apple are just they, Apple know that they're just taking advantage of the the uh, well the brand strength and the cult. I think, yeah. For now, definitely. I think they lead the charge, and then they lead the charge in a new piece of technology or a new piece of software, and then other people do it cheaper, better. But I was thinking what you said earlier about how uh, now HTC are making sealed bodies. I used to think it was more a case of Android or you know Windows Phone or any non-Apple sort of phone tablet product mm. was actually encouraging Apple to sort of re- relax a bit and you know be less stuffy about that sort of thing. Like maybe Apple, you know, they started using proper USB cables, not their own proprietary ones. Maybe because you know other phones started doing that. But it seems like this is a case of Apple, but everyone else is actually starting to follow Apple. Yeah. I thought it was going to be the other way around. I thought Canada. the emergence of Android might Warren. make Apple a bit less sort of up their own ass. Okay then, so does that conclude our discussion on the old Apple then? Have we come to a conclusion? Do, I think do we, we agree? We have, we have drawn to a conclusion that Apple is ruining Android. 
mm, as well. Yeah, and there's me thinking it was going to be the other phone companies were going to help sort of drag Apple up, yeah. but Apple's dragging them down, it seems. Yeah. So that's why they're even more overrated than they were when we started, I think. Yeah, I think that's an so. extra nail in their coffin. Yeah, nail, sign, seal, delivered. Moving on, I think I'd like to talk about one of the most underrated topics I think there is, and it's probably the bugbear of most people in comprehensive school. I would like to prove to everyone who's listening why maths or mathematics is an essential and interesting subject. Yeah, it's awesome. I'm with you on that one totally. Yeah, I'm glad I've got someone who I don't have to... Oh no, this is a... You're preaching to the choir here, but for the benefit of the listeners, let's do it. Yeah. Well, maths is seen as boring, mundane in the classroom. Boring, mundane, and ultimately, most people would say a lot of the stuff you do in maths, other than the basic adding up, taking away, is useless. Yeah. I know, that's the thing, see, because I think a lot of it is in how it's taught. Yeah. It's like, um, you know, the, the age-old sort of quandary is, to the average pupil, is what is this for? Why am I ever going to need this, you know? Yeah, why am I doing Pythagoras' theorem? Why yeah. do I need to know the volume of a sphere? I know, and the Pythagoras one, the best example a math teacher can come up with is, uh, oh, if a ladder's leaning up against the wall and the ladder is, uh, you know, the ladder is... 12 foot long and it's four foot away from the ground what you know how high is the ladder up yeah and yeah i mean that's the thing you know it's like it's hard to kind of relate it isn't it it is but um people should also meet them halfway and actually see try and try and actually just appreciate that that's not only what it's for it's for like a load of things you know any scientific engineering project it's the biggest reason why people should be interested in maths is because most people i think the majority of people go to university and a big portion of those are going to do a scientific degree, or a BSc at least anyway, so they could end up using, they would end up using maths. Absolutely. Every, every scientific subject uses statistics. Mm-hmm. Um, within the actual practical side of science, most of it will use mathematics in some way. Yeah, totally. Um, I think it's hard to convince a 15-year-old or a 14-year-old that that's a good enough reason to do it. And I think that's why maths is one of those subjects which is hard to prove to youngsters why it's interesting. Yeah. But maybe I think a good way in is getting the 18, 19-year-old students who are first and second year university students to tell their little brothers and sisters, I'm really struggling with maths now in university. I wish I paid attention. Because every person who I've spoken to doing a scientific degree bar a couple who excelled in maths anyway and like it, mm. they struggle severely with the maths and statistics side of it really badly. Yeah. In fact, it's so much of a problem that in Cardiff University, I know is one particular one, they've set up a drop-in once a week um, for students who are doing scientific degrees really? to meet with the maths department to get extra tuition, and it's a drop-in thing, so you can actually take a problem and say, help me sort this out, how do I go about doing it? Yeah, you know what, I think they had something like that uh, when I was in uni as well. I mean, I did music technology, and it's a similar thing. There was a surprising amount of maths in it to do with like things like acoustics and how, the way waves are built up harmonically and stuff and there was a drop in center for that as well yeah it, is, it does prove that there is a lot of uh, underappreciation and, and participation in maths yeah i think and i'm then, a latecomer to it because when i was in school i was a bit like you know i kind of liked it in ways but i also didn't really see the point of a lot of it you know and later it was after i left school and you know when it's well into uni that i started really getting interested into it in in a more sort of pop science sense, you know, yeah. just cool mathematical things. I've got a cool book about maths, like Cabinet of Mathematical Curiosities, and it is really interesting, and it's become, of a, you know, a large practical use to me as well in many ways. I've been learning electronics, uh, I'm a bit of a hobbyist programmer, need maths for that. I think sort of uh, maths has a lot of curios, a lot of interesting ideas within it, which are used to hook people using popular maths and books. There are yeah. books written on certain mathematical um, equations which are impossible to solve or, or, you know, there's a certain problem which they cannot come up with the perfect um, equation or, or way of sorting it out. Yeah, like has Fermat's last theorem been solved yet? Um, there's, there's quite a lot of them. Um, again, these are hard to relate to young people to get interested yeah. in maths. Um, I think maths teachers fight a losing battle when trying to persuade kids to be interested in maths, but there are some who naturally enjoy it. Now, for me... I didn't really appreciate, no one in my household went to university, so I never, I had no inkling in comprehensive that I, what maths could be used for. But I was one of the lucky ones who enjoyed maths because I enjoyed the mechanistic side of it. I enjoyed using a formula to get from one place to another. I enjoyed using yeah. an idea to get, come out with a product. And I found that 
fulfilling and I found it satisfying. It was really it is, satisfying. It? And that's what got me interested. I was in the top set in maths and we did um, an extra credit sort of uh, piece of coursework where we were given an equation and all we were told is we had to use this equation and figure out what it was expressing. Yeah. So the whole our coursework, the whole piece of it was to figure out what the equation was expressing. Uh, just out of interest, it was ex- it was an equation which described how round an object was. How round? Yeah. So That's you, interesting. So we basically took lots of geometric shapes and we we used the formula on them. Hmm. And what we realized is that as the, the, the geometric shape had more sides, the more sides it has, the closer it was to the number one. And then when we actually, obviously you can only get so many sides when you're drawing on a yeah. piece of paper. But, but it's got, like when you get like an octagon and nonagon, da da da, yeah. you add more sides and sooner or later it becomes a, essentially a circle yeah. anyway, doesn't it? But you, we obviously couldn't draw hundreds of sided shapes, which you needed mm. to get really close to one. But then we, when we did the formula just with a, a perfect circle, it was equal one. So um, what would be zero? Or is that unapproachable? It's sort of, you can get close to it, but you can't uh, achieve zero. The closest zero. you can get is a triangle. Yeah. To the most unround shape in very commas. Yeah. So there's that formula is a triangle because after then you need at least three sides to make a geometric shape. Yeah. So what does it do then? Does it sort of get the average of all the all the vertices and then compute each vertices distance from the average? Uh, I'm not sure. I can't remember. It was that long ago. I was 15 when I was doing it. Um, but I remember the formula itself was quite concise. It wasn't long. It was. It was a couple of lines, I think. It wasn't. It wasn't really extensive. And it's amazing the stuff they can you know, express with equations, mm. and even just for fun, I've seen a Batman equation, which is just a, like a, a polynomial expression, which on a graph just makes a Batman symbol. Mm. <laughs> That's really interesting. I think the reason maths is underrated more than it just being hard to get people to grasp why it's interesting is because there are some people, a lot of people, who struggle to actually do it. They struggle to actually learn algebra for instance is a big one whenever algebra mm. is mentioned a lot of people recoil and they can remember nightmares from school of algebra yeah it's, so, and the same with pythagoras as well people yeah. always put pythagoras up there with shakespeare in terms of the stuff they hated from school yeah yeah and it's strange because even though i found a lot of math challenging as it should be when you're learning i found it really interesting and thrilling whereas others got frustrated mm. and i think i and that is a mystery to me i don't know as a teacher with a pedagogy, you, this is the way you teach someone. I don't know what the best way is to approach someone who just genuinely doesn't like doing maths and yeah. doesn't like and gets frustrated with it. You can take a horse to water, can you? I suppose. Yeah. And uh, here's an interesting point, though. I mean, there's less discipline scores these days. So, um, do you back, think? Well, yeah. I mean, you know, in the sixties, say, you know, you had to sit there and listen to the teacher, or else, you know what I mean. Oh, and yeah, whether you liked it or not, mean. tough shit. Um, yeah. I'm not saying that's necessarily the best way, but. It's an interesting point, you know, to compare it to. But having said that, on the other side of that, the way maths was taught back then was shit as well. Didn't teach you how to think, did it? It was just like, uh, you just learn times tables and then regurgitate them like a parrot. That doesn't teach creative thought of maths and how it's applied. It just just become a machine spitting out numbers. Yeah. So, you know, the good old days. (laughs) Obviously, they weren't such good old days. I'm not saying you should bring back the cane, but um, if teachers had a bit more discipline... You know, a bit more sort of respect in the class, say, you know, was some, you know, a force to be reckoned with. Combined with uh, the modern sort of approach to teaching maths, which is less emphasis on just learning numbers and tables and rules and actually, you know, exploring for yourself and learning possibilities, you know? I think my maths teacher was really good. I had the same maths teacher. In a comprehensive, usually I have quite a few maths teachers, quite a few science teachers, and a lot of people will shuffle around different maths teachers year to year, but mm. I had the same one almost all the way through. So there was a more of a mentor-mentee yeah, kind of relationship yeah. building. And he made it more creative. He made it more interesting. And I think that's why I really liked it. Yeah? Yeah. I think he was one of the first teachers to use the method that we, you know, we were given that equation. I knew many people who'd done stuff like that in school. We're never going to convince those people who do hate maths that maths is interesting. But then that's where you've got to pull out these sort of fascinating little pop facts about yeah. maths and about how maths can be used and about interesting sort of ideas and equations and it becomes it kind of crosses over philosophy in the end because you know people see maths as a rigid way of well it is a rigid way of yeah. computing numbers and it is philosophical like is maths inherent yeah. or did humans just invent it as a way of seeing the world that's one of the yeah. big hot potatoes isn't it like yeah. nobody can agree because i suppose well, how could you it is because like 
before we were conscious or had consciousness, maths was at play. You know, thermodynamics did its stuff. Yeah, that's true. Um, I mean, you know, the ratio of a circle's diameter to its circumference was always pi. Yeah. Before we discovered that. Or, exactly. I don't know, Pythagoras. I, think, <laughs> was it him? No, I don't think Pythagoras discovered pi, did he? No. I think sort of, you fit the nail on the head really there, that it's been around forever because it's what governs the universe. Yeah. And that is, I was going to come to that point actually, the reason why I find maths the most thrilling idea, not necessarily a subject I'd study because I'm going to choose to study genetics, but... Which will require maths. It will require a lot of maths. Just like any science, you know? Yeah. But I think it's because it is so universal. Maths governs everything. You can describe every feature of our universe using maths. Mm. And I, I think that is really a thrilling idea. Um, I see it as making it puts us in, it gives us our place in the universe that we are just another biological, mechanical, mathematical equation which has come along. We're just a speck yeah. clinging to a rock in space. Yeah. and But it also gives us. It elevates us intellectually because we were the first animals, probably, I'd argue, or first beings, maybe, in the whole universe to actually look out into the universe and say, oh, it is maths. Yeah. We're here by maths. We, or to even we chase, count, we chase, We chase animals and hunt down animals using game theory and the mathematics around that. And Yeah. Uh, I think that, that elevates us far above a lot of beings, a lot of animals, because we are so aware of what how our universe works using maths. And um, one thing I did read, actually, in a sort of quite a short but nice little book called, I think it's just The, the Story of Mathematics, and um, the author placed its roots in, well, its roots in agriculture, counting, you know, tally sticks, counting your animals, your livestock, you know, and well, kind of counting how much grain you've got. And uh, it was argued that one of the first reasons for counting was just for this sort of thing, you know, hunting and farming. You know, you know how many animals are out there to kill or how many you've got to slaughter how many are pregnant and how many are going to produce more pigs, say? I've never thought about that aspect before, but thinking about it, a lot of ideas jumped into my head of how mass could be used. Now, anim- crops are grown on cycles, yeah. which run off to a certain amount of time, certain amounts of suns up and down. Mm. Um, it, it, to know where you were in the breed, year, you had to be able to count the days, didn't you? Animals breed in season, and you can actually predict, if I get this piglet, these pig producing this many piglets, then in... Three years' time, I could have this many. You extrapolate, so they would have done yeah. guesstimates. Exponential on, growth. Yeah, they would, have done, they would have done guesstimates on the amount of piglets they've seen being born and how many are they going to have in, say, three years' time. They could make decisions with that then. Oh, I'm going to have, say, 100 pigs by that time, which means I'd be able to sell them off and, and buy this or you know get this bit of land. So maths was probably really heavily used in agriculture. Absolutely, yeah. Obviously still is, but um, I can see how straight away my... my I'm quite ignorant about agriculture, but I can see the use in it straight away. Mm, and war as well. I think like war, hunting for food and agriculture, all those ancient human problems were like the driving force but you know, behind the development of maths. Just learning yeah. how to count was a start. How many enemy tribes men are over there? How many, you know, gazelle are over there? Another aspect I think I find I, I do find it really fascinating is maths as a subject which is studying higher education. Yeah. So obviously studying pure mathematics, as they call it. Uh, I wondered how many people actually go for those degrees. Are they full every year? Because they are so difficult. They are a lot of number crunching, a lot of learning Um, equations and theories. And there's no real direct practical application you can do in class. So I was about to say that. You work on a blackboard. Yeah, and it's just maths for its own sake to an extent, is it? So, you know, going back to the schoolboy who just doesn't see the point of maths, that's sort of like the ultimate of that, isn't it? It's just maths for its own sake. Masturbation. (laughs) <laughs> masturbation. I can imagine some people who like masturbation are people who really love numbers mm. in the form the form of numbers. So say there's a lot of people with Asperger's and autism who love math. Yeah. They can't get enough computing. And the, probably that for them is a dream. Yeah, have you seen the film Pi? Directed by Darren, Ar- Ar- Darren Aronofsky? I have trouble saying that one. Darren Aronofsky. Yeah, he directed... No, um, seen it. Well, I think he was involved in those new Batmans, but he also did a film called Requiem for a Dream. But... His film before that was Pi about a mathematical genius. He's being pursued by, well, first he's being pursued by this Wall Street company who want him to like predict the stock market, and on the other side he's being pursued by a group of weird sort of Hasidic Jews who want him to decode the Torah, and it just drives him insane. And there's a Kate Bush song called Pi, and I think she she likes to write songs about films and books. It could well be about that. It's about the same sort of thing. 
And one of the lines is, he loves, he loves, he loves, he does love his numbers. Yeah, that's it. And they run him in a great big circle. That's really fascinating. That is really fascinating. But yeah, sorry to cut you off there. No, that's fine. That's fine. Um, I was going to say, uh, I've talked a lot about why I love uh, maths and why I think people should love it. Um, I will do a bit of a summing up a little bit later of why the listener, you, should love maths and encourage children definitely in maths. Um, but is there anything else you would like to add, Sam? Is there anything which is copping into your mind which yeah. you need to get out There's one thing that um, strikes me as sort of uh, worthy of saying. It's like, kids, if you're listening... Okay, maths is great and it is relevant. I know your teacher is a bit of a dick and he probably has no charisma <laughs> and he's a complete plank and he's not doing it just. He wears a cardigan. Take it from us. Maths is great. Your teacher is just not teaching it to you right, okay? He's probably a boring old plank. So yeah. just try and see past that and trust me, maths is awesome. You know, look at a Brian Cox or Neil deGrasse Tyson. They'll tell you. And they're down with the kids, aren't they? Exactly. And look at any sort of um, popular scientist these days. They've got to love maths to some extent, or at least know how to use it. Oh, yeah. Like I say, I did a music technology degree, and even that had a maths module on it. There's probably a lot of creative types going into that degree, yeah. if it still exists, or they did. Um, they went into it wanting to learn how to record, and they bet you any money they didn't actually look up the modules and realise they'd be stuck in front of a whiteboard doing math. Yeah, I mean, it, it was a bit of both. And I think they just, yeah, they wanted to just be able to sort of play play like, with knobs and buttons and record themselves, you know, yeah. which of course that's what it's about to an extent. But audio engineers, you know, they, they know a shitload about electronics. And, you know, in the 60s, the studios used to build their own mixing desks, you know. It's not quite like that now. But, no. you know, it helps to be able to just understand the equipment you, you're using, you know, or be, even be able to solder a, a lead. So those who should be behind the knobs and those who should be soldering the knobs. Yeah, and then the other people who were, were the knobs. <laughs> <laughs> and then there were ones yeah. in the back sucking the knobs. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, that's turned, that turned a corner, didn't it? That turned a corner. Yeah, I, I was just, there was some overlap. I mean, I could draw I you think, a Venn diagram, but uh, we'll leave that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think to round off, really, why I think you, the listener, should tell your nieces, nephews, sons, daughters young people in your life, why they should love maths, is because when you get to a certain age and you realise the world runs on fundamental laws, mm. you will see the world in the matrix style. You will look at the road and see mathematical angles and, and proportions and constants. Yeah. The, like sun rays coming down with angles and... Yeah, refraction in, refractive indexes and like why rainbows work because yeah. like all the rain, all the little tiny droplets of water, whichever angle relating relative to the sun you are to it, causes a different spectrum or a bit different band of the spectrum to reach your eye according to where in the sky that droplet is. That's fascinating, isn't it? The moral of the story is get your kids into maths. Get your kids into maths. Yeah, and forget your teacher's complete lack of charisma. He's tr he's doing his best, but you've got to meet him halfway. Trust me, it's good stuff. And you could be the teacher of tomorrow who's going to be cool and funky and twerking on the desk and measuring girls' and boys' legs yeah. with a protractor and a set square. So yeah, thank you for joining us, and uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. Okay, goodbye. <laughs>